Okay, so in the last video, we had talked a little bit about um, some simple uh, arcs and loops here. Um, reflexes primarily, a little bit of spindles. But how do we control more complicated behaviors, right? How do we actually make, uh, say, repeated behaviors or things like that? How do we make those things work? And in fact, most behavior is this sort of stereotyped pattern, right? Uh, we might call this uh, rhythmic behavior rather than like a one-off, okay? So that at that point, the question is not just how does the, the flexion or the extension happen, right? I mean, that's all interesting in the, its own way. But how do we generate the pattern? How do we get the timing of that right? right? Is it down to just having to do things the same way every time, or can we make it a little bit easier on ourselves? So one thing we might look at, we might begin to look at something simple like the wing pattern um, in, a, in a locust. So a locust has, uh, like we saw before, asynchronous flight muscles, okay? Um, so its uh, wings are attached directly to the, the exoskeleton rather than to a muscle, right? And because of that, we have a nice little hinge that we can have a little sensory structure at, right? A proprioceptor and also a proprioceptor here for depression. So this is gonna tell us when the wing is up and this is gonna tell us when the wing is down. And so one simple idea here, right? Might simply be that contraction of a muscle is tied to reception of the opposite activity, right? If we wanna go up and down and up and down and up and down, right? Really simple way to do that is to simply have the wing up sensation trigger the wing down muscle, and the wing down sensation trigger the wing up muscle, right? So in doing so, right, we go up, down, up, down, right? Or rather up, so up, down, and then up, down, right? And continue this kind of back and forth, back and forth. Now it's, it's one way to get around it, right? But generally speaking, that's not how most things actually work. Uh, one way, so this is kind of an idea here, um, the one we just talked about, it's called peripheral control. Okay. And this peripheral control is some external cue, external here to the muscle, right? External cue causes contraction of that muscle. So we feel that the uh, wing is down, is pulled down, so we lift it. We feel that the wing is up, so we pull it down. For vertebrates, and indeed a lot of invertebrates, um, that's not really that useful. It's not really the, the easiest way to go about things. And so instead we have what's called the central control hypothesis that governs a lot of things. And the central control hypothesis is built around what we call a central pattern generator. And a central pattern generator in the central control hypothesis differs from the peripheral control hypothesis that we don't require sensory feedback. Okay, we can do so entirely absent of external cues. Now, there, there still can be some. Right, they don't have to be absent, but they can actually be absent. Most typically we think about CPGs being present. Right, now they're not entirely autonomous. They can be reset by sensory information, but okay, they generally are thought to be responsible for most of um, these behaviors. And the reason we think that is that most of these repetitive behaviors follow what's called an oscillating pattern. Okay, and if you have a fan at home, it's not really warm enough to have fans on, right? But you have a fan on, you can set it to oscillate, right? Where it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's all an oscillating pattern is, right? Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. And so we think of central pattern generators largely as being oscillatory type. Okay, some of these can be what we're gonna call, and pull my pen out here, cellular oscillators. 
cellular phone, right? But here, thinking about a single cell, right? So these are cellular and they generate a pattern by themselves, okay? These guys down here, C and D, are what we call network. oscillators because they are built obviously on a network of neurons they require some kind of interaction right some kind of inhibitory excitatory loop right and they can work in different ways we this one here the half center model we have a single excitatory signal sent to both neurons okay but one depolarizes faster than the other right so whatever one depolarizes first sends an inhibitory signal to the other. And then eventually that signal wears off and it, the other sends an inhibitory signal back to the other direction, right? So in this case, we one turns on, turns the other one off, and the other one turns on, turns the other one off, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. More complicated patterns can emerge. We can get what's called a closed loop model uh, where we have maybe two or three different neurons all in a chain. Again, the same idea holds true, right? One inhibits the next, inhibits the next, inhibits the next, right? And so we have this continual pattern of turning on and turning off. Here we synapse in a loop rather than being um, across two of them, but it, it ultimately doesn't really make a huge difference. So an example of one of those things might be looking at um, what we call the pyloric circuit of a lobster. Now, a lobster has a fairly complicated digestive system by our standards anyway. Um, <clears throat> requires a, a fairly robust pattern of movement, of grinding, of shuffling of food products around, okay? And so the way that each of these three parts, right, the pyloric part, the gastric mill, and the cardiac sac, all kind of pass things back and forth and back and forth and back and forth has to do with one of these closed loop models, right? We have three different cells, right? And this is simplified, obviously, but three different cells that have negative feedback loops upon each other so that we go one on, the other one on, the next one on, one on, the next one on, they on, okay? So it's gonna begin, right, with these guys, right, inhibiting the pyloric part and the um, LP part here, right? The LP recovers first, okay, and inhibits both these guys and those guys, right? And then these guys come out and they inhibit these guys and those guys, right? So again, bing, bang, boom, bing, bang, boom, bing, bang, boom. It's a big, long circuit. Uh, and these can be, you know, pretty, pretty robust, they can be relatively simple, right? As long as it's a stereotyped pattern, that's really all that matters. The way that they tend to be modulated, right? The way that they tend to be run is through a special set of neurotransmitters that we call neuro, if I can find my pen here again, neuro modulators. So things like dopamine, serotonin, octopamine, okay, these act to be the chemical messengers in this pattern of excitation, inhibition, excitation, inhibition. And like I said, they, they can be simple behaviors, they can be really complex stuff, right? So um, horseshoe crabs, I don't know how much you know about horseshoe crabs, they're cool, they're awesome. Um, they have a really elaborate respiratory mechanism, okay, uh, whereby they have to spend a certain amount of time every hour um, cleaning the surface of the gills off, okay? Um, so they go through periods of, of ventilation here, which are the white blocks, right, marked with a V, and then periods of cleaning in between those. And this is on about an hour and a half, 80 minute cycle, give or take. 
okay? And this is controlled by a central pattern generator, which is pretty interesting. Now the question is where central pattern generators reside. Um, it's a good one, certainly. Uh, we've thought about trying to figure all this stuff out um, and we do so with animal experiments. And this is kind of weird, I, I will admit, um, but I think it's important to kind of look at. Um, and one of these experiments was looking at how, um, say, locomotor uh, activity is, is controlled, where the central pattern generator actually is. Um, and so here we've got uh, a couple of different ways to kind of see if we cut off information, do we still get a walking behavior, right? And so one idea here, right, again, by sectioning the brain, okay? So leaving all the life support stuff attached, but taking the higher brain functions out of it, okay? And then later on, uh, a second experiment was to transect uh, the spinal cord itself here, uh, down here. And what we find, right, is that as long as we apply the neuromodulator, right, in this case L-DOPA, right, or clonidine, actually clonidine works too, um, as long as we apply those neuromodulators to this section of the spinal cord, the animal will walk, okay? Uh, what this tells us is a couple of different things. The stimulant for the CPG does come from the brain. Okay, so it provides the L-DOPA, provides the clonidine, L-DOPA, the clonidine is the artificial part of it. But the CPG is actually back here in the hind limb. And I have a little video here. It's weird to see it happen, but this is the one of those cats um, that was segment and it's put on a treadmill here and we've brought the uh, stimulant here to it and you can see it's still walking, right? The brain has been sectioned, but it's still walking. And as we change the speed of the treadmill, the gait changes to match it, right? We go into even a little gallop here at the end, right? So that CPG, is entirely within the spinal cord itself, which is pretty wild. Here's a less disturbing video. <laughs> um, here's a little baby. It's not my baby, but it is, a, it is a baby. Again, on a treadmill. This baby can't walk. This is a young of your baby, but it's on a treadmill. And it's receiving the stimulation to do so. So independent of higher brain function, we're still getting that, that pattern, that behavior. So with that in mind, now with both kind of simple reflex arcs and central pattern generators kind of in our pocket, uh, we're gonna look here just real briefly at how the body coordinates and controls complex behavior kind of at the larger scale, right? Um, and so we've seen here, right, that the brain has ultimately higher function, higher control, right? But the actual output to all that stuff comes back here to the spinal cord to the motor neurons themselves, which are in turn, can be modulated by input from sensory structures like spindles. Generation of movement occurs in the brain, involves three different parts. Okay, so we have the primary motor cortex that we saw before. This is responsible for the actual generation of signal, right? And which particular neurons are stimulated here and when is often the responsibility here of this premotor area, right? the stuff right in front of it. And this is what we learned before, right? The final piece here, uh, the cerebrum, okay, has higher control here over, again, expected versus um, actual, right? So if those spindles are not giving us the right information, yes, it goes to the spinal cord, yes, it goes to the alpha neuron, but it also comes back here to the cerebrum where we modulate here through the reticular system or we modulate those activities. Now, we talked before when we talked about the brain, about the idea that we've got homunculi, right? Where we arrange those parts of the primary motor cortex specifically to control certain parts of the body. The premotor cortex is, is kind of the same idea, right? Only rather than specific 
parts of the body, it controls specific behaviors, right? So uh, purposeful movements of the limb, purposeful movements of the face, right? Those packages of behaviors, right? So as I grab my coffee cup and take a drink, that package of behaviors, the facial movements, the movements of my uh, pharynx to swallow that, the movement of my arm to bring the coffee cup to my face, different regions of this primary motor cortex are responsible for each of those packages of stuff, okay? So again, it's, it's very specifically oriented, right? Very specifically arranged, but rather than by body part, by body part, by body part, it's by behaviors. And everything works together here in this sort of fairly elaborate, complicated pattern of do, receive feedback, do again, right? It's very much like the scientific method is really what it comes down to for us, okay? All right, so that's good enough for me as far as I'm concerned anyway. Um, we'll call it good there, and then in the next set of videos, we'll move on to something completely different. We'll get away from muscles altogether and uh, go on from there.